Hello, everybody. I am Marco Orellana. I am CIDAI's manager. As you know, CIDAI is a key element for the Catalonia AG strategy. Our mission is to demonstrate the advantage to speed up the adopt adoption of innovative data exploitation and artificial intelligence technologies. We are working on several tasks to increase the adoption of this technology in the territory. One of them is this masterclass. In the following weeks, we will publish all the masterclass that we are going to do in this year. Before to introduce our speaker, if you work in an SME and you have ideas to develop some proof of concept with AI technologies, please visit the project EU Hub for Data. Here you will find some interesting financing opportunities. Today, thanks to DiploHub and Barcelona alumni, our speaker will be Agatha La Pedriza. She is a professor at the Open University of Catalonia, director of the Artificial Intelligence for Human Wellbeing at the eHealth Research Center at the Matation at the same university. She is an affiliated research as, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT Media Lab, in the Affected Computing Research Group. In this masterclass, our speaker will offer an introduction to affective computing, the discipline that studies system and device that can recognize, interpret, process, or simulate emotions or feelings. Remember, remember you can ask all the questions that you have. We will have 10 minutes to discuss, to discuss your doubt at the middle and at the end of the sessions. So please, Agatha, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you. Can you can you hear me well? Hopefully you can. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Can you see my screen? Let's see. Um, I hope that's fine. Uh, that you can see my screen and everything. Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna do like um, a, a class uh, on affective computing, and and the plan is to give you um, a little bit of an overview of the field. Um, and uh, I know that there's uh, the, the the audience has a, a diversity of backgrounds, but hopefully there there will be some technical details, but hopefully everybody will be able of following everything. So um, let me see. Okay, so let's start about talking what, what, what is affective computing. So affective computing is the study, development, and development of systems and devices that can recognize, interpret, and simulate human affects. So in, in this class, I will be talking mainly about the recognition or the perception of the human affects, and human affects means emotions, mood, and feelings, and so on. Um, about interpretation, so the idea is that you want machines that are able to recognize these emotions and also interpret and somehow understand what these emotions mean. And at some point, being able of uh, properly responding to any emotion that is perceived, that's the idea of the interpretation. And, and in terms of the simulation, there are some, uh, some scenarios that you might be interested in, in machines or that, that can somehow simulate this, this human affect. And one scenario that you can imagine is, for instance, in video games, right? If you have a character that has, um, you know, the character is actually an AI and you can interact with this character in this video game. So eventually you want this character to be able of uh, simulating some kind of human affect in front on, of, uh, in, in, when, when it's facing some specific situation. So that's a, a little bit the idea and, and the motivation of the simulation part. Um, so, affective computing as a research field um, was, uh, was first introduced by Professor Rosalind Picard, who is a professor in MIT Media Lab. And um, to give you a little bit of, of the history of the field, so it started in, in 1995, formally, when the, the book uh, called Affective Computing was uh, published. This, this book was uh, written by Professor Rosalind Picard, and this book is the, the one that introduces the the affective computing uh, topic, uh, research topic. Um, and then um, in 2005, so there are like two milestones that are important for the affective computing uh, community. So in 2005, it was the first edition of the, of the conference in affective computing. 
and it's been a biannual conference, conference, so happening once uh, every two years from 2005 to 2021. But now it's going to be an annual conference after 2021. So this uh, also illustrates how the community is growing and how um, uh, the research in affective computing is progressing faster. And then in 2015, uh, it, it was the first um, issue in, in, uh, of the journal in affective computing. Uh, and and uh, definitely, if you want to be um, aware of the recent progresses of the field, I, I think that these are uh, two sources that are very important, both the, the conference on affective computing and this journal, where you can see the, 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 the current progress and, and that is happening nowadays. Okay, so um, one thing I want to discuss a little bit is why, why do we want machines that uh, can recognize, can perceive emotions? Because at the beginning, when, when the field um, you know, when, when, when the field appears for the first time, people uh, were a little bit surprised because um, people thought about the AI as something very rational, and, and it was kind of surprising to, to incorporate in this uh, rational AI the need of uh, perceiving emotions, interpreting emotions, and so on. So the reason is that, um, uh, so one, one of the motivations of why, why do we want AI that can understand and deal with emotions is because emotions are actually very, very important for humans in our everyday life. So uh, emotions play a very important role in our social interactions and, and also are very important to detect uh, people's needs and, and for predicting people's reactions. Uh, and actually, when uh, when we imagine the AI of the future, the robots of the future, so if we read the, the science uh, fiction books, or if we if we watch science fiction movies, and we see all of these robots that can interact with us in a socially intelligent manner, we see that we always imagine these robots of the future with this kind of emotional skills, with this capacity of understanding the emotions expressed by humans and responding accordingly. And actually, if you have watched at least one of these movies, you'll see that sometimes even these robots specifically say how, how important and how difficult it is for them to understand the emotions of humans and to properly respond to these emotions. And although these are examples of science fiction, so these are robots that do not exist nowadays, um, we are starting to see some robots that uh, have some kind of uh, social skills. And here, what I'm uh, illustrating is, um, um, is a, a news that, that was published um, like a year ago uh, that was talking about this, uh, this proof of concept or these this user experiments with, uh, with a small social robot that was interacting with, uh, with elderly people. And uh, what these robots can do nowadays, or what the, what the designers of the robot are trying to do is, you know, uh, have this robot at the at people's home, and 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 this robot can um, give reminders for the medication, or can provide the specific information such as weather conditions, or can help the user to give an alarm to the emergency services in case the person needs assistance. And so nowadays, these robots uh, cannot actually have like an open domain conversation in a socially intelligent manner. But uh, this is one of the goals that they can act as well uh, as companions in, in some specific situations. And for that, you definitely need these robots to understand that we are human, uh, emotional beings and that in front of the same situation, we might respond differently depending on how we feel. Okay, so, um, okay, let's uh, assume then that we really want that, that there are some scenarios where we want machines that can actually you know, understand and emotions, perceived emotions, and so on. So the, the question now is how do we design these machines? Uh, I mean, how, how do we design these AI systems that can perceive emotions when emotions is something that is even very complex for us. Sometimes we don't know uh, exactly how we feel or we, uh, we have hard times in understanding um, the expression of, uh, of others, uh, of the emotions of others, right? So how can we expect machines to really understand emotions or perceive emotions? So one, one of the key ideas uh, for that is that there are, some, there are a lot of signals that change when we experience different emotions or when we try to express different emotions. So for example, our physiological signals change. Um, so I'm sure that um, most of you have experienced some time when you feel nervous or a little bit stressed that your heart rate increases. So that's an example of change in your physiology, in your heart rate, which is a specific uh, physiological signal. 
And this change uh, happens because there's a, there's a change in the emotions that you are experiencing. So some physiological signals might change when you experience or when you strongly express an emotion. Now, other examples are like visual signals. Uh, we um, see that we communicate a lot with our face, for instance, with smiles. So there are a lot of facial gestures or uh, body gestures and body poses that give uh, a lot of information about our emotional states. And another important signal is language. So the, the words that we use when we talk, for instance, or the words that we use when we, when we write, also contain a lot of information about our emotional state. Um, and our voice, so um, the volume of our voice, so there are like a lot of features and you know the, the, the speed with that the, our, our, the speed of our speech, you know, also, also can be uh, informative of some changes in our emotional state. And our behavior, so our sleeping habits, our, the fact that we are exercising or not, the diet, uh, whether we are having more or less social life, this can also uh, be meaningful about our emotional state. So, for instance, if you imagine sometimes that you are very stressed because you have a lot of work, so suddenly you probably have less time for exercising or for meeting your friends. So it's going to be a change on, on these behaviors because of the stress that you are suffering. So the idea is that you have um, all of these signals that change depending on your, on, on your emotions. And these signals can be captured, like, uh, so for instance, the physiological signals, you have different devices, uh, different um, yeah, devices that can capture uh, these physiological signals. So for instance, smartwatches uh, already capture your heart rate, or for the visual signals, you can use cameras uh, or microphones to capture your voice and, and so on, right? So you can capture these signals and you can store these signals in a numeric, in a numerical manner in a computer. And then what you can do is you can use machine learning or AI to process the signals and, and to find some kind of patterns or uh, you know, to classify these signals and so on. And this is the main idea behind uh, all of this, of all of these systems that uh, attempt to do emotion recognition. But to understand it a little bit better, let's focus in, in one particular signal. Let's talk about visual signals, visual features for a, for a little bit. And if we think about um, emotion recognition, I'm sure that you probably uh, think about understanding facial uh, expressions. So actually, there's been a lot of research in trying to understand facial movements and trying to capture emotions expressed by the face. And there's been a lot of research in computer vision. And, and actually, nowadays, there are already some commercial systems, like the one that I'm showing here, which is the, the software from Affectiva that um, the system can uh, give an image, it can detect the face, it can detect facial key points, it can analyze the movement of these facial key points and recognize some expressions of prototypical emotions. Um, and the reason why there's been a lot of uh, research and interest in understanding, in, in understanding facial expression is because uh, uh, we communicate a lot with our faces. And to show you that, um, uh, as an example, let's, let's uh, I would say let's do an experiment, but unfortunately I cannot see your faces, I cannot interact with you. So um, anyway, I, I will not know your answer, but uh, the goal of this experiment is I'm going to show you two videos. And these are videos of a new pastor explaining a news, okay, explaining some news. In one video, the new pastor is explaining some good news, and in the other video, the new pastor is explaining some bad news. Um, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the video. You, the only thing, you're not going to listen to anything. There's no audio. So you just will see like the facial gesticulation and the, and the body uh, gestures. And the goal is to know what video um, corresponds to the good news and what video corresponds to the bad news. Okay? Okay, you're ready? Let's um, take the video. So video number one. Video number two. Okay. Um, I cannot ask you. I don't know your, uh, what you think, but hopefully uh, all of you agree with me that first video corresponded to positive news or good news, right? We had, uh, we, we, we could observe the, the new customer smiling more often, so the expression was really different. And, and the interesting thing is that, you know, the, 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 the newcasters try to be somehow neutral and very professional in, in explaining the news. But there's, there's some 
facial language that you can still capture and they, they communicate with the face, right? So this is a study that we did uh, some years ago in 2015, and we were using actually not uh, the current state of the art techniques. So the, the techniques that we were using are, you know, are not used anymore. There are, there are some techniques that work best, but the idea was the same, right? Detecting the face and analyzing these facial key points and the movement of the face. And, and actually we were pretty successful on that. I mean, the system was like 85% accurate in this specific problem, but I'm sure that the current techniques would do a much better job. So overall, we see that it's true that we express a lot with our face, but the, the question is, okay, is the face enough? Can we just you know, recognize emotions of people just by looking at the face? And here I'm gonna show you some, uh, I'm gonna try to illustrate what are the, the difficulties of just relying, I mean, uh, the problems of just relying on the face. So imagine that we see this, this uh, image now, uh, this is like a you know, an uncontrolled scenario, and imagine that we run the same type of uh, algorithm for detecting faces and uh, analyzing the facial expression. So this is uh, one of the answers that we have. So we can the, the algorithm can detect the face of this woman, and it says happiness. It detects a smile, right? And that's the reason why um, it says that the person is expressing happiness. That that makes a lot of sense, right? But what happens with the man? So actually, the, the, the algorithm it's not able of giving a response for the man. And the reason is that you have a, a more complicated uh, perspective of this face, right? It's a profile, so you don't see all the facial key points. Actually, there's one eye that is occluded, and you just see half of the mouth, right? And the other thing is that this man is wearing eyeglasses, so actually you don't even see uh, the eye that, that is supposedly visible. It's not even visible because you have an occlusion produced by the eyeglasses and there are some highlights, right? So the, 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 the message here is that, you know, sometimes you have non-frontal cases, you have partial occlusions and, you know, you don't, you don't see what's, what's going on with the face. So let's see another example. So here it's just a um, um, frame of a, of a video again. And if I run the, the same algorithm, it's going to detect the face perfectly, it's going to detect the facial key points, and it's going to say that this woman is surprised. And the reason is because this woman, so if the, the, the mouth is a little bit open, and this uh, is a little bit like the prototypical expression of, of surprise. But the truth is that this woman is not surprised, she's just talking, right? So second point is that some facial expressions are not related to our emotions, but maybe to our actions, right? So then, you cannot read emotions when there's nothing being expressed at that element. And the third uh, thing that, uh, that happens is that it's very difficult to give an emotional meaning to an isolated facial expression. And this is a problem that has been studied from a psychological perspective. So in this case, uh, these are, this is a study that was done in 2008. And what the, what the research were doing is they were showing to participants these face, faces um, you know, uh, with some kind of prototypical expressions of, uh, of emotions, and they were asking people, okay, what do you think that uh, this, um, this uh, face is expressing? It's maybe anger, it's contempt, it's disgust, it's fear. So they, they realized that people didn't actually agree. So they, they thought, okay, what happens if we suddenly give more information, you know, not just the face, but let's zoom out and let's give some contextual information, like this one. So then here people agreed that this was disgust. Okay, cool. So, but what happens when you don't change the facial expression, but you change the context, like here? So you have the same facial expression, but it's a different context. And this context is like a, like a gesture uh, that is kind of aggressive, right? So suddenly people were perceiving anger. And they, they created all of these illusions with the same facial expression and different types of context. And people were actually very influenced by the context when they were attempting to recognize the facial, the, the emotion um, expressed by the face. So this study proves the importance of context and the fact that we don't um, rely just in the face in order to capture the, 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 the emotion expressed by people. And this is the study. So there are some um, different, different um, experiments that were done in this study in case you wanna, you wanna go deeper on that. And there are other studies that are more recent that also you know, show these evidences on, on how important it is to understand the context in order to give a proper um, meaning, emotional meaning to a facial um, expression. Okay, so uh, these were studies from a psychological perspective, but one of the things that we are trying to study 
is uh, the, the, this, this uh, problem of incorporating the analysis of context from a computational perspective, right? So we want to do these emotion recognition models that hopefully um, do the same job as we humans do, right? That uh, can combine the information of the face, of the gestures, whatever um, we see in the person, but also the contextual information to do um, a better perception, a better understanding of the emotion that is expressed or that a person might be experiencing in a specific situation. And when we um, do this type of research, there are like two parts that are uh, very important. I'm going to simplify here a little bit uh, so that you can understand the, the global um, view of how we approach this research. But basically, one important uh, uh, element here is the data. So you need to use data. And what we did in this case, so what we did is we collected different um, images of people uh, doing different things, people under different situations. And one of the things uh, that we needed for, for these images is we wanted some ground truth, right? So usually what, what you do when you, when you try to create these computational models that can recognize uh, emotions, you use what is called uh, 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 supervised machine learning. So basically you, you show to the machine examples of the tasks that you want the machine to do. So in this case, uh, we want the machine to be able of um, uh, perceiving uh, emotions that are being experienced, probably experienced by these people or probably expressed by these people uh, in, these, in these different circumstances. So you need to show the machine a lot of examples of uh, images and what are the, the, the categories or the labels that you want the machine to automatically recognize. So for that, one thing that you need to, to think about is how do you want to represent the emotions in the machine? Right, and this is uh, something that I want to spend some time on. Um, because one way of doing that is, okay, imagine that you use uh, a representation that is uh, motion uh, disregarded. So for instance, in this case, you might say, okay, so this kid, my, uh, this, this uh, um, boy might, might be feeling anticipation as the, defined as the state of looking forward or getting prepared for possible future events or um, excitement, like feeling enthusiasm, stimulated or energetic. This is probably because of the, of the action that uh, this person is performing or engagement, right? Uh, he's definitely paying attention to what he's doing. Otherwise, he, he would be on the floor and not on, on the scale. Okay, so, and this is a way, uh, so you, you, can, you can put labels that are actually these uh, emotion district categories. And there are some standards. So what, what, what the, the question that you might ask yourself is, okay, what are the, the discrete categories that I need to consider in my study? So there are some standards. So the most, uh, probably the most popular one is the six basic emotions that were uh, proposed by Paul Ekman in 1971. So in this case, it's a collection of six basic emotions. It's happiness, sadness, surprise, anger, disgust, and fear. And this representation of emotion in six categories uh, is being uh, widely used. But one of the problems of this representation is that it's a little bit limited, right? So we know that emotions are complex. We, we have many more categories. So it's, it's a little bit poor just considering six basic emotions. So depending on the, on the research or the, the application that, that you have in mind, it might be enough, but often it's not enough. So there are other standards like this uh, uh, chic, um Wheel of Emotions. This is another another um, collection of, uh, in this case, 28 categories, and it's basically built on top of the six basic emotions, and, and it basically add, adds uh, two more categories, and then and you, you have like different intensities of each of these dimensions, and, and it, uh, this creates this model that uh, represents emotion in 28 categories. Um, but uh, another another common practice uh, when you do research uh, or, or you do to, to, uh, some, some kind of emotion recognition system is to create your own list of categories uh, depending on the needs of your research or the purpose of your research. And this is what we did in, in, this, in this project actually. So we define our own 26 categories, thinking of what are the emotion categories that can be recognized in just a single image, right? What are the, the I mean, we, the goal was to be as fine grained as possible, so to have as many categories as possible, but to make sure that, um, that they, are, they are not repeated. Okay, so do we have more options to represent emotions in the machine? The answer is yes. So, uh, this categories is one option, but another option 
that is uh, very common is to use continuous dimensions. And continuous dimensions, there are many continuous dimensions, but the three more popular ones or more commonly used ones are the three ones that I'm going to explain. So one of them is valence. And the idea is, okay, you have this continuous dimension that just represents whether the emotion is positive or negative and nothing else, right? So one extreme is very negative, one extreme is very positive, and then you have all the different degrees from negative to positive. And th this dimension doesn't encode anything else. And um, the second one is arousal. So in this case, arousal is uh, measuring whether the emotion is something that is calm what is or is something that is uh, you're feeling something like very active, right? And you can you can think about it as your as your heart rate a little bit, right? So to what extent you feel very very relaxed and calm, or to what extent you are ready to act? So all your body is really agitated and active. And the the interesting thing of these dimensions is that you know you can be very agitated because you have some very positive or some very negative emotion it doesn't matter arousal just measures this agitation level is valence where the dimension that, that captures the negative versus positive and then the third one most common is the dominant right whether and this means that okay in this situation do we think this person feels dominated by the situation it's like there's no choice there's no option is the situation that controls you this would be like the dominated one of the um, uh, you know, one of the extremes, and the other one is where you really feel in control, right? Situation that you know you're, that you are in control. Okay, so this is another way of representing the emotions in the machine, and actually this is known as the PAD model, and it comes from pleasure, arousal, and dominance. So I I, I call it valence, the first one, not pleasure, but uh, it's it's more now nowadays it's it's uh, usually people say valence and not pleasure, but it's just the same. And then, you know, there's um, all of these uh, studies on whether these representations are equivalent or not. Uh, and, and these attempts of, of um, like the circumplex model that I'm showing here, where you have these two axes, the valence and arousal, and you try to map the different uh, emotion categories in these axes so that you see that you might have some equivalence. Uh, but there's no, actually, there's no agreement on whether these two representations are equivalent or not. Uh, to be honest, I think that uh, this is a personal opinion, but I think they are complementary. So, um, yeah, the choice that you do to represent your emotions in the machine really matters. So it's, it's a choice that you really need to, to uh, think about when you do research or when you try to do some application that uses this kind of technologies. Okay, so in our case, going back to this uh, emotion recognition in context um, study, we, we use both representations and, and what we did to collect these, these labels, these annotations that we needed for the images, is this kind of annotation interfaces. This is a common way of collecting what is called ground truth, right? These um, two um, categories that are associated to the images. So basically, you show to these images to people and you ask them, okay, can you please check all the categories that you think that um, this person here that you see might be experiencing or might be expressing? And this is the way you collect the, the and then this is the other uh, annotation interface that we had for valence arousal and um, Okay, so you design, you can, so a way of collecting ground truth, and this is also an important um, aspect when you do research on affective computing, is um, yeah, how do you collect the ground truth? This is one option to, to use uh, crowdsourcing in this case and, and human annotators that, that provide these labels. Okay, so after after using this crowdsourcing with the annotation interfaces, you, you have this collection of images with the annotations. And then you have the second the second part of the of the research, which is your computational model, right? So what we want to do at the end is a computational system that uh, takes as input an image that was never seen by the system and hopefully produces some output that is are maybe these um, these uh, emotion categories uh, that have been detected in this person or maybe the uh, emotion dimensions that have been detected in this person. And regarding to this computational model, so this is not a class on, on computational models or deep learning, but uh, I, I, I want to um, enter a little bit here. So, so um, basically we use, we, we use deep learning and, and the way of thinking of this computational uh, model is it's like, it's actually like, a, it's a mathematical function. So the thing is that your image is going to be represented in the machine in the machine in a numerical manner. So an image at the end is a collection of pixels and each pixel has three components, right? The intensity of red, green, and blue. So it's like a very big box of numbers. 
So in this big box of numbers, you can perform mathematical operations. And you know, um, we, what we do, as I was saying, is we use uh, deep learning models with this a specific type of models, uh, of machine learning models. And in this case, what we did is, um, well, this is a representation of a deep learning model. And um, okay, one thing that I like everyone to understand here, uh, even though you might not have a background in machine learning, is that these models are represented or are, are a collection of layers actually. So I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Um, anyway, hopefully you can. Um, so you have these um, these uh, layers, and the idea is that each of these components that is a layer in your model takes something as input. So the first one is going to take an image as input. It's going to perform some computations and then it's going to produce an output and the output produced by the first layer is going to be the input of the next layer and then the next layer is going, to produce, is going to do some computations and produce another output and so on and and these models are very flexible because you can you can have as many as many layers as you want or you can connect the, the layers in different ways there are different types of layers and so on and that, that this gives you a lot of flexibility in the design of these of these computational models so in our case, what we did is a, is a computational model that has two parts. So hopefully you can see uh, yeah, my mouse and, and you can see that um, first we have um, some- Yes, some... we can see it, Agatha. Sorry? We can, we can see it, your oh, mouse. Great, great. Okay, so you have first this uh, body feature extraction and this means that here, the input to this, this part, the red part, is gonna be like the, um, the image containing the person that you are attempting to um, recognize uh, the emotion of, and then um, it, com it makes some computations to extract what we call features. So something that represents the information of this window of the, of the image that contains the body of the person. And we call this like the body feature extraction. And then we do the same for extracting the image features, which will encode the information of the context. So the input here is the whole image, and then we we do all of these computations and we extract some re feature representation of what's in the image, in the context. And then we combine this information, we do a concatenation, which is what uh, it's represented in this block here. And then we do some, here we have uh, fully connected layers, it's a type of layers in your deep learning models, but basically you do some more computations until the very end where you have, you know, the, the um, uh, discrete categories and the continuous dimensions that are the annotations that we are trying to, to model. And basically, uh, what we did here is we studied different types of encoding the information, so different variants in how you extract the features, both for the body and for the image, and then and different ways of um, on the on the recognition side, right? Different ways of um, you know doing like just the, the recognition of the discrete categories, doing just the recognition of the, of the continuous dimension or the combination, and we studied a, a lot of uh, variants of the same uh, computational model. And then, well, we have some results. I, I'm not gonna enter into the results, just the, the main idea. These are some qualitative results where you can see the ground truth. So what are the true annotations of the, of the, of the images and what's recognized by the best model that just looks at the body and the best model that looks at the body plus the context, the body and the image. And what we observed is that the, the, the context was providing meaningful information. So in general, the, the recognition of the emotions were a little bit better when you incorporate the, the context, but still the results are not very good. So this is a system that is far, far away from, um, from being perfect and from being uh, useful. This is just research. But uh, um, anyway, so we were um, studying how to incorporate this analysis of context. So if you are interested in this, in this problem and this research, you can visit our website. So we have the papers that we published and we also have the code and all the data and, and so on. Okay, so this gives you an idea of how we can approach uh, from a computer vision perspective in this case, right? This emotion recognition. We have the data, we have the computational model. And so far I've been talking about one of the problems uh, in, in affective computing, one of the main problems, which is and this uh, perception of, uh, of the emotion, right? Of someone, we see someone in an image or in a video, you can have also a temporal dimension. And the only thing that is gonna change is your computational model that should be able of uh, having as input, not just a single image, but you know, a collection of frames, right? Which is a video. And then, but you can, you can do um, the same type of research with video. And the type of uh, question that you're trying to answer is, you are trying to create this computational model that answers the question, okay, what is the, the, the emotion that this person might be feeling, right? But there's another perspective that is interesting, which is the perspective, the perspective of the observer, right? And this, this is the problem of image sentiment analysis. And the question here is, okay, 
I'm not asking what would be the emotion of the person that I see in this image or in the video. I'm trying to understand what is the emotion of someone that observes this situation. And this might be different because the emotion of this person here might be scared or embarrassed because it's falling down. And the emotion of someone that is seeing the situation might be worried. So it's a different perspective. Okay, so um, uh, sentiment analysis, image sentiment analysis is also uh, called, uh, it's a problem that uh, is also known as the emotions uh, evoked by images, is a, is a very active area of research. And here you can approach it in a, in a similar manner, also uh, using some, some uh, collection of images that have these labels and then you create the computational uh, model. So let's, let's discuss a little bit about a very, very simple approach. Um, in this case, let's suppose that uh, we are going to take a data set, as I was saying, with images with the label labeled with the emotions that are experienced by the observer that is what is uh, looking at these images, right? And then what we are going to do is what it's called fine tuning a deep learning model for categorizing the images according to the problem of sentiment analysis. Okay, so um, one one example, very very simple example of, uh, of the data set that you can use is the um, IAPS. This is a, a, a small scale data set. It just contains 1,000 images. And you have, um, um, oh, you, you have valence, erosion, and dominance. You have the, the, the six basic emotions. Sorry, it says, oh, quite scale, yes. Valence, erosion, and dominance because you have uh, five values for valence, right? From one to five, erosion from one to five, dominance from, from one to five. And then the six basic emotions of Paul Ekman. You have already these annotations. And then this is how these images look like. These are, you know, very object-centric. Object-centric means that uh, the image basically contains an object, in this case, a butterfly. Um, this might be a, an example of image of a scare, something scary, here again, something dangerous, right? So you have these images that look very object-centric. So um, one thing that you can do is you can, um, you know, create a, take a deep learning model. So one of the things of these deep learning models is that they have a lot of parameters. So usually to train these models, you use a lot of examples. So uh, I was saying that in the simple approach, we were going to use um, this uh, small scale data set with just 1,000 images. This is not enough for training um, a deep learning model. So one thing that you can do when you don't have enough images is use pre-training and then fine tuning. And, and here in this case, what I'm illustrating here is a, a deep learning model that is, uh, it's, a, it's an architecture that it's called AlexNet. So it's an architecture that was proposed, I think, 2000, 2012, 2013, and was uh, widely used in the past. Now it's not uh, used as much as it was in the past because people usually use deeper models, meaning that you have more layers. Here you see that you just have you know, eight layers. But anyway, the, the idea is that you can take any of the shell uh, architecture. You can use uh, an image, uh, uh, an object-centric data set to train, to retrain your model. In this case, um, uh, you can use uh, ImageNet because uh, ImageNet is, a, is an object-centric data set and, and the images of the, of the data set that we are going to use for sentiment analysis are very object-centric. And basically, ImageNet is a collection of images of different objects and you have the object categories, around a thousand of object categories, and you train the model to recognize what is the object category, right? So the thing is that if your model is able to recognize what is the object category, and you want to slightly change your problem to okay. Now I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm gonna still show you images that are objects, but I want to. I want you to recognize. So I want the system to recognize the sentiment of the object. So if the if the model is already able of recognizing the type of object, um, training the model to recognize the sentiment should be more or less easy. And and maybe the model does not. So actually, the model does not require as many images as if you try to train everything from scratch. So a common practice is, you know, you just change the last layer, you put here the categories that you want to recognize, and you take your small data set and you do this fine tuning. And fine tuning means that you keep training, you, you keep showing to the system the images of this uh, image sentiment analysis with uh, categories and with the emotion categories, and you just add, um, tune the parameters of the model so that the model can do this, uh, this uh, the recognition of these emotion categories instead of the recognition of the, of the object category. Okay, so if you do something like that with this pre-trained model and with this small data set, and then you test with the small data set, you can actually perform very well um, because uh, you are testing with the same type of images that are very object-centric, very, very typical, and in this case, the original image is happiness, and here 
the shit that the system is telling you, okay, this is happiness. And this is actually, you can do some explainability techniques. So again, um, uh, I'm not gonna enter much in, in, in deep learning today, but um, but maybe uh, if you if you work in AI or you know, use AI, you have heard about uh, the interest of, of explainability. So the explainability means that you want these systems uh, not just to be able of providing the output to us and telling you, okay, this is happiness, and, or, or I see happiness in this in this image, but also uh, you like you like uh, models to tell you some reason or some um, explanation of why this happiness was recognized. And this is one one type of explainability techniques that is is uh, is based on uh, um, creating this kind of heat maps that tell you what are the region of the images that were most informative to recognize a specific category. So in this case, you see that the happiness kind of uh, the focus is, is the flower, but then you can you can um, see if there are other types of uh, of um, uh, emotions that, that the system can recognize in this image. And the interesting thing here is that, for instance, you can see the fear uh, recognized uh, where, and the bees where you have the highlight, right? So that's very interesting because uh, you have this, uh, this bee here and, and it correlates with the capital fear. So if you do this, what you get is uh, nice results in very typical images like flowers, balloons, babies, cute animals, scary animals, and so on. But unfortunately, of course, this approach is not going to scale to uh, more general images. For that, what you need at the end is probably a larger data set. So a, a data set that um, has many more images, many more examples, and maybe more, more um, emotion categories in case that you want to be more fine grained that you want to recognize beyond the six basic emotions. So you will need a, a larger um, scale data set and, and you will probably need also a more um, sophisticated or tailored um, deep learning architecture that it can capture better the information that you want to extract from the images to recognize the, the, the emotions. But at the end, the idea, so I'm, I'm explaining this simple approach because I want you to understand the, the final idea. And the idea is this one, right? That, but of course, if you have more data, if you have a, a more sophisticated or a, a better, better models, then you can, you can um, do a, a recognition that can generalize more. And here, so in case that you are interested in, in that sentiment analysis, I wanted to point you to some recent works um, that, uh, that were um, published uh, recently, uh, where um, you know, um, they, they, there are some pretty supervised approaches, meaning that you use data that is labeled, but also you combine it with data that is not labeled, and how can you do that? And then also some, some uh, examples of works that use visual attention, and then this visual attention allows you to um, provide these uh, explanations uh, as well, what you see here, these this heat maps, where you um, can, can see the highlights of where in the image do you have the information that is meaningful to the recognition of the categories that, that you want to recognize. And, and, and in case that, that you want to know more about the uh, image sentiment analysis, I recommend this reading of um, this recent survey on visual sentiment analysis. Okay, so so far, uh, I've been talking about how can machines recognize emotions and, and how you know, we have been talking about uh, visual features and the problem of emotion recognition and sentiment analysis, right? Different perspectives. So one thing is recognizing the emotion of the person that I see, the other thing is recognizing the emotion of the observer. And then we have been talking about the importance of emotion representation, whether to use categories and dimensions and the different options for, for categories that we have. So let me jump a little bit to another signal, which is the language. Uh, I want to spend a few, um, some minutes talking about language. Um, and, and, and about language, so uh, in, in, in the affective computing field, so you have um, the, the, the area of research of text sentiment analysis. And here the idea is the following, right? So, so uh, let me illustrate this, this idea of text sentiment analysis with an example. And here, and um, what I did is I just quoted in Google um, the reviews of the Red House restaurant, so which is one restaurant that uh, I used to like in, in, in Boston. And, and if you if you go to to um, to Google and you and you query for a restaurant and you check the reviews, you, you find some text, right? And and if you focus in a specific piece of the text, here it says, okay, we have the lights, very big menu, great um, glass cocktails, and potential atmosphere, blah blah blah, right? So you have this text. And the thing is that. This is not saying whether whoever wrote this revision, this review, really like or not the restaurant, but there is some sentiment, some 
there's something included in the text that tells you about the emotion of the person that was writing this, right? So if I tell you, did this person uh, like the restaurant or not, you probably will agree with me that this person liked the restaurant. And the reason is because there's some positive uh, sentiment in this text. And that's the, the, the idea of text sentiment analysis, right? So uh, given a piece of text, uh, being able of having some computational system that tells you, okay, this text um, is having some positive positiveness on it, right? Like um, valence classification in this case, or you know, you can do valence regression, so you can try to recognize a score of how positive this text is, or you can try to recognize some kind of emotion category, right? I mean, you have to be more different way of representing the emotions in the machine. But another interesting thing that you can try to do is to predict emotion, uh, emotions, right? So emotions are very interesting because uh, we use them widely with uh, our text messages. And actually, these are a way, so we use emojis to emphasize the, um, the emotion that is hidden behind our, our, um, our, our text, or our, uh, whatever we, we write. Um, so, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because um, emoji prediction is uh, one of the ways of approaching uh, uh, sentiment analysis. And it's actually one of the ways of, of getting a, a state of the art system. And uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about this work, text sentiment analysis uh, called DeepMoji. And the idea here is um, DeepMoji is a deep learning model for language trained with uh, tweets. So basically, they use millions of tweets. Um, and like this one, imagine the two wonderful uh, concerts yesterday in Barcelona, and you have this emoji associated to this tweet. So they collected these tweets that have at least one emoji. And what the task they approached with uh, the deep learning model is, okay, I'm going to get this input this text, and I'm going to try to get this output the emoji that goes with this text, right? And for that, they use the 60 most frequent emojis, which are these ones that I'm showing here. And, and they approach this as a 60 class, uh, um, uh, a one class classification problem across 60 classes. So you have the 60 emojis, no? And then you have, of course, you have some trees that have multiple emojis, something like that. What do you do, right? Because it's one class, it's a one class classification problem. So no problem. You, you take the same, uh, the same input twice, and you have um, two, two uh, training samples in this case, right? So the text with the first emoji, the text with the second emoji, and you use both samples in your training set. Okay, so in case you are interested in, uh, in the code and, and everything, you can find the author's implementation code in Keras here. There's a PyTorch implementation, and there's an online demo, which is very fun because you just go there and you find these where you can insert some text, and you'll see the emojis that are recognized uh, here. And actually, the, the, um, the deep learning model that is behind that is an LSTM with a tension mechanism. And the nice thing of this attention mechanism is that it allows you to, um, you know, activate or deactivate the specific words and see how the prediction of the emotions of the emojis change when you just change a few words of your input. Um, okay, so interesting thing about the deep emoji results is that um, it's it's very good at doing some things that are very challenging, like some subtle changes. So here you see two sentences. There's just one single word that changed. That, that, that is different between these two sentences, but this single word um, completely changed the meaning of the sentence and, and the system is able of, of capturing that. Then uh, very good at sarcasm, which is uh, another uh, very challenging um, aspect of, uh, of uh, text sentiment analysis. And here you see some examples where uh, sarcasm is actually very well captured by the model. And then uh, some sentences with the, with the word uh, love, where the word love uh, plays a very important role in the sentence, but the meaning of the sentence is completely different. And you see that uh, how the, the, the affect of these sentences is also captured by the, by the module. Um, so this is a very interesting system because um, it's a supervised system, but notice that you didn't, I mean, nobody had to manually label these sentences, right? You can just use things that are available online, which are this collection of tweets that already have these emojis that you can use for your supervised model. And that's very interesting because you can then collect a lot, a lot of training examples. Um, of course, this is not going to be perfect in the sense that the model is going to be a little bit biased, you know, that the way you, so that the text of the, of 
the tweet Twitter messages is very specific. There's a very specific style that is very different from the style maybe that you have in a in a text that is an email, for instance. So you you will probably if if you want to use this to reuse this system in another domain that is not uh, recognizing affects in, in, in the tweets, you will probably need to do some, some fine tuning again to, again to do this knowledge transfer into a different domain, but still you will have um, a, a very strong um, uh, pre-trained model that uh, it's going to contain already a lot of information about affect that is going to be useful for um, any job that you might want to do uh, in recognizing affect in text. Okay, so in case that you are interested in, in text sentiment analysis, here is another uh, pointer that I wanted you to give. So Dimoji is it's definitely one state-of-the-art system, but another thing that you can do is you can fine-tune um, NLP state-of-the-art uh, transformers like BERT in this case, right? So this, uh, this is like a deep uh, learning uh, language model that, uh, that is a state-of-the-art for several tasks of language and classification. Um, or other parts related to language, like uh, question, answer, uh, question answering, um, and 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 you can have uh, you can find uh, multiple tutorials that uh, guide you step by step on how to do this fine tuning with a uh, with a data set that is labeled with um, affect. And here is just a pointer to this collab tutorial uh, of, uh, in in terms of here. Um, okay, so um, so far uh, we we talked about visual features, we talked about language and. You remember at the beginning I told you that there were like other 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 type of signals that that you can that you can use to recognize emotions. I'm not gonna enter into the other signals, but I want to give you pointers in case you wanna know more on how you can deal with these signals. So for the case of physiological signals, um, yeah, I have to say that each physiological signal is very different. Um, so they are very very interesting, but the way you, you do the signal processing and you do the feature extraction and you and the way you deal with each of these uh, signal, electron activity, heart rate, or respiration rate, is very different because the characteristics of, the, of each uh, physiological signal is very different. So, in case that you wanna you wanna see an overview of how you can use uh, these physiological signals for emotion recognition, I think this is a good uh, reference that that you can that you can read. And regarding to the voice, so um, the same, right? I mean, you, at the end, the idea is the same, right? That you extract these uh, signals and you encode the signals and you, you use the machine learning and on top of that to the recognition of the emotions. And here is a pointer that you can use and that, that you can read in case that you want to know more about the voice. This is a very um, recent uh, paper. And then in terms of behavior, um, here, yeah, I also pointed uh, you to this, uh, to this paper. Uh, yeah, so one one big area of research in this uh, in this case in the, in the case of behavior is um, okay. You, you can capture a lot of uh, behavior passively with the use that people uh, do with the, their technology. How how people use their technology, right? The, so so the things that you interact almost I mean every day with your smartphone, right? And your smartphone. Has a lot of sensors. It has an accelerometer. You have GPS, so you can know um, whether someone is indoor or outdoor, right? And the thing is that if you process this information that can be captured passively, you sometimes you can know you can you can detect changes of habits that I don't know can be um, uh, informative of some uh, early uh, symptoms of. Uh, of depressions or mental disorders. So nowadays, there's a lot of interest on how to, you know, capture these changes of behavior in order to do early detection of uh, some kind of uh, mental um, diseases. Okay, so um, I wanted to take a short break now um, uh, before entering to the applied uh, research on, on, on uh, automatic emotion perception. I don't know if there's any question. Um, yes, Sarah, we have some questions uh, in Catalan and in English. I will do the first in Catalan, then we, we come back to, to English. Uh, el trabajo de que las máquinas reconocen... Sorry, no, 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 no,
Perfecto. Uh, el trabajo de que las máquinas reconozcan el global de emociones humanas sembla no tener fin. ¿Cuándo podremos mm. conseguir este muy en cara? Yo le digo en inglés, en español, en catalán, en más igual. ¿Catalá? Ah, si vols en catalán y después torne a inglés. Vale. Eh, sí, sí, hasta muy lluny encara. <laughs> Definitivamente. Es, es muy complejo. Yo creo que lo que estem, lo que se está conseguiendo ahora y que potser això quedarà més il·lustrat en la segona part de la, de la xerra amb els diferents exemples concrets de recerca, és que es, pot, es poden reconèixer en alguns estats emocionals en algunes situacions concretes. O sigui, el que és realment un repte és reconèixer emocions, el que es diu in the wild, o sigui, en qualsevol circumstància, no? un sistema que funciona universalment i que, com a mínim, tan, tan acurat com ho som nosaltres, que tampoc som tan alts. No, realmente no son tan, tan buenos para las emociones. Para nosotros también es una tasca complicada. Eh, pero tener sistemas que, que puedan funcionar de la forma que funcionan los humanos, yo creo que es muy bien. Pero, de vegades, para algunas de las aplicaciones, eh, para aplicaciones médicas o para aplicaciones de experiencia de usuario, tú no necesitas reconocer alguna emoción en un contexto que está muy restringido. Y ahora vamos a ver ejemplos. A las horas, aquí sí que como enseña también algunas tecnologías que comencen a ser útiles, que comencen a reconocer algunas cosas que nosotros podemos aplicar y que, y que puedan eh, ayudar en algunos casos a las personas. Perfecto. Y la, la segunda pregunta es si no me decía un modelo que transmite las emociones al suma, de las humanas, de los humanos a las máquinas, o existe ya en mes. Eh, un modelo que... ¿Puedes tú no repetir la pregunta? Si no me es, ¿existe un único modelo que transmite las emociones humanas a las máquinas? No, no, o sí. Sea, el que estoy cantando en esta pregunta es: si no me es, cuando digo transmitirlo, entiendo que el que lo digo es un modelo que aparece, ¿no? Que captura que estas emociones. Y no, no, no hay un modelo, no es. O sea, eh, realmente, en otra recerca, en veure cómo puedes crear estos modelos computacionales que yo veía, y al final. La gracia de estos modelos computacionales es que haga tú de entrada y que es un favor que rápido. Si de momento no miren, no entran en los modelos, nos interesa la entrada y la sortida. Y ahora, claro, dependiendo de la entrada, el modelo ya es diferente. Porque hemos hablado que la entrada por ser text, la entrada por ser eh, imagen, la entrada por ser audio, todo tipo de cosas. Dependiendo del tipo de entrada que tú tienes, al procesar que tú pases de la señal y al tiempo que tú pases de la modelo, es diferente. Es diferente de la entrada, el tipo de dades que tenga. La otra cosa es que hay diferentes tipos de modalidades. Eso es una cosa que no me enseñan, ¿eh? pero muchas vagadas las diferentes o los diferentes tipos de señales se parecen en el tipo de mandato. Yo, ahora, ahora voy a imaginar, ¿eh? pero yo estoy interactuando con un robot social y el robot social más que el robot social. El robot social puede eh, ver una nueva imagen y todo lo que yo expreso visualmente, ¿no? la más es la gesticulación corporal, pero a mí es que es un poco más de un poco de esa sangre. La señal crua de audio, el volumen de ver, un speech to text, ¿no? Transformar las palabras que yo digo en text y después analizar qué text y el sentimiento de la gente. Y por si no modelos, canalizan las señales a la vagada, en paralelo, y que fusionan la información que se de las diferentes señales y el conocimiento de la emoción. Y ahora, no, realmente ya muchísimas formas de, de diseñar estos modelos, muchísimas formas de combinar las diferentes señales y, y yo creo que es, bueno, es va a recerca en ver quiénes son las mejores soluciones y muchas veces las soluciones dependen de las circunstancias en las que tú vols aplicar el modelo o en las que tú vols utilizar el modelo. Espero que respondas. Sí. Come back to, to English. We have some other questions. Eh... The first one is the annotation of image. What in, in annotation of image, what is the agreement of different annotators? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, um, an important aspect in, in all of these research fields is that there's some ambiguity and there's some subjectivity that we always need to deal with. So of course, if you if you show an image to a person and you ask this person, 
how do you feel? Let's, let's think about image sentiment analysis. When you ask this question, how do you feel when you see this image? So probably different people are going to perceive different things, are going to experience different things. And that's, and that's okay, that's natural, it's subjective, right? The thing is that there are some aspects, I would not say that are universal, I don't want to use this um, universal thing, but um, there are some aspects that is right. And if you show an image of a cute baby, most of the people are gonna agree that this is a positive, that it, 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 it produces a positive uh, emotion. But then there are other things that do not uh, produce agreement, but usually people, there's some consistency when you focus in one person, right? So for that reason, sometimes it's important, so depending on the use case that you have in mind, you need to do some personalization of the system. So for instance, if you think about, again, the, the application of uh, social robotics, and then you imagine that you have some social robot at home, imagine like an Alexa, you don't even need uh, to have a camera, right? Something that you can um, uh, speak you can talk to this uh, to, to this device, right? And it responds to you. So probably at some point you might want the system to specialize on your your own way of communicating, right? You need some some degree of personalization for for this machine to really understand what you are trying to express in a specific situation. And that's that's definitely another area of research. So the thing is that agreement, subjectivity is definitely a challenge. The nice thing of, of this is that sometimes challenges just are, you know, a, a new opportunity for, for uh, new research, right? It's just a, a new problem that you need to study. But uh, subjectivity is definitely one of the things that you, that you need to have in mind. Thank you, Alata. We have two more questions and then we will continue. In the perception of emotion, is there a cultural difference? Yeah. The, there might be a cultural difference and there might be um, all those emotions. There are some studies that are very interesting. Uh, so if, if you imagine that you want to do, for instance, uh, you want to create a system that uh, captures the emotion expressed by the face, and probably you will need a slightly different system in Japan and, and the US. And, and I'm, I'm mentioning these two specific countries because I, I, read, uh, I read a paper that specifically discusses the differences between these two countries. So um, the, the, the um, um, amount of movement of the face, the degree of, of expressivity might be different depending on the culture, depending on the country. So you might, you might need to adapt your technologies uh, to different regions if you want them to work. Yeah. So yeah, there might be some cultural differences. Yeah. And the last one in this break for emotion recognition, can one combine different signals, for example, visual languages in the same computer, computational model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I briefly mentioned that, but uh, yes, let me, let me just come back. Yeah, it's definitely something that you can do and something that is interesting to do because often the different signals uh, give you different information. Um, so, so if you if you combine different signals in a, in a combined in a computational model, you might you might definitely have better accuracy. So yes, the answer is yes. And the last one: if there is, there is a difference between the state of, of the recognition between a sentiment um, yeah. uh, in like. Uh, when you talk and when and for image, uh, text and text uh, and an image, which one is more uh, developed? Um, I think which one is more developed, text and image? Um, I think there are more data sets for image. I think it's been uh, more studied for images than for text, but. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of uh, of works uh, on both on both uh, image and text. Uh, and again, yeah. Um, so, so one important thing to have in mind is that uh, you might have a system that works very well in the text domain, but still in in a specific context. Like um, what I was uh, explaining about the emoji. Uh, if you train the emoji with tweet with uh, tweets. Um, you probably will get a system that is very good at recognizing the affect on tweets, right? 
but it doesn't mean that this that this um, model is gonna perform well in another text domain, domain in a different text domain. Like for example, imagine that now I want to um, uh, uh, sentiment a text sentiment analysis model for understanding um, affect or capturing affect in news, right? In newspapers. So the the the, the language, the, the 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 text itself is very different. It's very different. Um, how you write the news in a newspaper, or how you uh, how you tweet, or it's very different how you I don't know write emails, for instance. I also say, I mentioned this this ex this example. So one thing that you need to be very careful is that if you just take the Twitter text sentiment analysis and you apply it in a in a different text domain, it it it, it might not work well, right? So you you definitely need to to recheck again that the system is actually doing what you you expect it to do in this new domain and probably it's not going to happen and in, in, it, it will require for you to do some additional work some fine tuning and some and, and some change in the model so that it can recognize the asset in these different types of texts um, but uh, I, I, I know the, the, the yeah the question of What's more advanced, the uh, image versus text? I think that it's a uh, it's, it's similar. That there's there's a lot of research done in both uh, with both uh, signals or modalities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Agatha. We, we can continue to the next the next part. Okay. So um, now, uh, what I wanted to do in the second part is um, explain some more applied research of automatic emotion perception and mention some of the of the works that we are doing um, in my group um, so that you can see some examples where you can apply these technologies of affect recognition and how these technologies can be can, can provide some benefit uh, to humans um, so one of the of the areas of research where you can apply these technologies is definitely um, social robotics so a social here you have an example of a social robot where um, you know this robot it, it is a it is a robot that can um, listen listen to what you say and it's able of doing some speech to text is able of analyzing the words that you said right and then providing some some answers so the idea is that um, I mean, it's it's this technology it's 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 not completely developed but the, the future idea is that at some point you can have these uh, little robots that can have with you uh, a conversation that uh, in, a, in a socially intelligent manner right a, a conversation and that you know and and for the, for this conversation to happen in a natural way as i was saying before you definitely need this robot to understand the emotions that you are expressing and to respond appropriately to those emotions so in this case um this is a uh, one uh, work uh that was published in, in 2020 on, on social robotics. And here, what we were trying to do is um, to provide this robot with some, uh, with an ability of, uh, the ability of acting like an emotional well-being coach. And what we did uh, we, uh, with, this, um, with this robot, with this Jibo, is that um, we, we did some, some uh, user tests uh, with uh, MIT students. This was a user study that was that happened in, in MIT in 2019. And, and what we did is we designed uh, seven sessions based on positive psychology. So basically, um, you know, the, 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 the robot uh, was, uh, was um, I mean, we, we, we took the robots to the, to, um, to the students' home and they had the robot for a week and then they, they, they were supposed to interact with the robot and every day for 10 minutes and every day they were like uh, doing one session that as I was saying it was design, designed according to uh, positive psychology so the first session for instance was a brief introduction to positive psychology and what the robot has encoded is like a short conversation of 10 minutes basically the robot is providing some information and eventually the robot is asking the user Okay, do you want to do an exercise of that, or do you want to answer or explain me uh, something specific? And then you know the user interacts, and and you know there's a there's a, a small decision tree implemented in the robot so that if the, if the robot, for instance, asks a yes or no question and the user says yes or no, then you have a, a different answer, right? So 
we have these 10 sessions implemented, sorry, seven sessions implemented in the robot, one that introduces positive psychology, the second one is about the character strengths, so we uh, explain what the character strengths are, and the, the, sec the third one helps the user to identify some of the strengths. Fourth one is uh, about uh, um, gratitude, well, uh, focusing on the good things, then the fifth about gratitude, one about savoring, the sixth one, so about um, you know, being aware of the good moments and, and trying to enjoy the, the little the moments and so on, right? And then there was a wrap up. So uh, one thing that we were very interested in, in knowing is whether, you know, having this uh, robot at home interacting with you and helping you uh, learn, learn about positive psychology or some kind of habits that you, you can consider to, to adopt in, in order to improve your well-being is whether it was producing some kind of change in the psychological well-being, in the overall mood, or in the readiness to change, right? And how ready you are to do some changes in your life in order to feel better, to have more well-being, right? And one thing that we observed, this is, um, so we use like a standard questionnaires, and one thing that we observed is that um, here you see that the, the result of the, of this scale, psychological well-being, overall mood, and readiness to change, before in blue and after in orange, the study. So we observed an improvement, uh, a small improvement in all of those, um, in all of the, uh, in, in all of these um, three scales. So, which you know, it's it's kind of promising because it, it looks like you can actually use um, some uh, robotic devices, like a social robot or even your assistant in the phone, to help you work on your well-being. And now, so one of the interesting thing of these types of studies with social robots is that. Um, with these studies, you can collect data that uh, allows you to improve the, the, the capacity, the perception of the, of the robot, right? So, as I was saying, when the robot is interacting with the person, and so these participants um, gave the consent to, to, for us to, to record the session, so we can analyze the face, we can analyze the facial, the, the, the gestures, uh, we can analyze a little bit in their, the environment, we can analyze the spoken words, right, the text that the person is saying and the, and the audio and so on. And the idea is, um, with these signals, can we try to uh, um, create these computational models that can uh, automatically learn some things that are important for the robot to know in order to interact in a more fluid manner. For instance, uh, can the robot perceive something about the personality of the person? Can the robot perceive something about the, the psychological well-being or the overall mood? And sometimes you have um, this, you have ground truth here because um, you ask the user um, to fill some forms and you have this uh, scale, so you have some ground truth. And then you might have manual annotations as well. You can have experts like psychologists watching on the videos and, and you know, annotating some, some events or some, some, uh, some patterns that are meaningful and then maybe you can work on trying to automatically detect this pattern. So, um, as I was saying, one, one of the areas of research and that you can apply this, uh, this affective computing and this uh, perception of the user is in these social interactions and in trying to do these machines that help the user to, uh, you know, to perform some tasks or to feel better or to uh, act as companions in specific situations and uh, to overcome isolation. Okay, so another area of research where these uh, technologies uh, are, are applied uh, uh, is uh, in, in assisted driving. So in this case, we have um, one study that tries to do, um, yeah, uh, tries to predict the, the stress of the driver by analyzing the road scene. But the idea of these assisted driving technologies in general is that, okay, uh, it might be interesting for so we, we talk a lot about autonomous driving, right? But the reality is that uh, cars that can uh, drive um, by themselves autonomously, it's, 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 it's a technology that probably we, we won't have um, soon. It's very challenging. But what we are observing uh, already now is that cars help us driving uh, more actively every time, right? I mean, the cars are provided with different sensors, you have cameras, so you have a lot of help right now from the car. And one interesting uh, thing to monitor is the uh, emotional state of the driver because there are some emotional states that can affect the performance of your driving. So for instance, if you feel stressed or you are distracted or um, if you are very tired, right? These are things that can, can be, types of emotional states that can be dangerous. 
so that if the car can be aware of these possible dangerous uh, affective states and maybe do some some interventions to to help you in these uh, situations where you are having a harder time to drive this is something that can be interesting and useful and for sure to improve the experience of driving to make you drive in a more comfortable way so in this specific um, uh, research what we were trying to um, uh, do is to recognize stressors in the road scene and um, so so here is the idea so imagine that you have these two scenes uh, scene a and scene b and i ask you which of the two seems more stressful so if you were a, drive, a driver and you are driving in scene a or you're driving in scene b where do you think you will feel more stressed so when you ask these two people people usually answer scene a and the reason is that in scene a there's more traffic there are pedestrians in, in, in the road so there are some things that are more unpredictable so you need to be um, more alert when you drive in scene A than when you drive in scene B that, you know, there's no one, just the road, you know, it's, it's more straightforward. So our hypothesis is that there are some objects and events that are visible in the driving scene that are informative enough to approximate um, the, the, the subjective stress level of the driver. And the idea is we would like cars to, to be aware of these differences, right? Of these uh, situations that are particularly stressful. Um, and the way we studied that with, was with this type of data. So we had um, a data set where um, you have uh, someone driving and you have a camera pointing to the, to the same road, like it's here. And then you have um, information about the, the self-report stress of the driver like uh, you can have a specifically the self-report stress, like let's say the, the degree of stress that the driver is feeling at every time step, but then you can also have a physiology, right? You can have a bracelet or you want maybe a, a chest band if you want to capture the respiration rate, but you can also capture these, um, these physiological signals. And the idea is, okay, so can you, from the whatever you see in the scene in this, in this image, can you, infer automatically this uh, in, in this case we were studying the self-report stress so as i was saying we were using a data set that is publicly available so here you have the name but basically um you have uh, different drivers um and doing the same circuit and you have a camera pointing uh, to the road you have a camera pointing inside the car but we were not using um, this uh, this use for this study and then you have this self-report stress this is what you see here at every time span, right, the amount of stress that the, that the driver is experiencing. Um, so what we did is we basically um, divided this uh, self-report stress in three different categories um, because we observed these three modalities. So basically, we, we wanted to recognize uh, situations of low stress, of medium stress, and situations of high stress. Here you see some examples, uh, just uh, one example for each of the three categories. So they were saying the, the amount of traffic, uh, the amount of elements that you have near the road or in the road seems to be something that uh, is meaningful. Um, so, okay, so basically what, what we wanted to do is, okay, now we have this, um, this video that is showing what's happening in the scene and we have the self-report um, stress. And what we want to do is we want to learn this kind of classifier, again, this uh, machine learning, uh, a model that can predict uh, this degree of stress. And basically we were exploring um, different uh, options, but since we're a little bit, you know, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip these details. Um, uh, but basically, just let me go to, the, to this, sorry, to this last call here. Uh, basically the, the idea is that we, we um, compare different ways of, of modeling this. And one way was using just the object presence, so there's uh, running some some scene segmentation and looking, so so encoding what objects were present in the image, and then doing some classic machine learning like random forest linear SVM or, or kernel SVM. And then we were also using the, the two last one, the single frame and video sequence are end-to-end -end models, deep learning models. One of them just uses a single frame, and the other uses a single uh, a video sequence, right? You use also a temporal dimension. And what we observed is that using temporal dimension is what works the best. 
Um, so if you if you want to know more details about the, the models and the results and so on, I recommend you to read the paper. But basically, the best accuracies that we could obtain are um, 0 0.72 in this data set, uh, and the random accuracy would be 0 0.3, right? Because we have uh, the, the it's a three-class category problem. So it looks it looks very promising. So that the data set is a bit limited because there are a lot of participants, but it looks like you can use this approach to definitely um, create computational systems that can, that can uh, automatically understand the different degrees of stress that you can face when you are driving. And more generally, there's a lot of research in, 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 in assisted driving, as I was saying, and in trying to monitor the, the stress of the driver. And, and one thing that you do is uh, to, to, for, for this research is you can, you can um, have different types of sensors in your, in your car provide your car with these sensors. And as I was saying right at the beginning, uh, in the affective computing uh, research, the design of devices, the design of sensors that allow you to capture signals um, that are meaningful to, to uh, perceive um, uh, the emotions of people is one, one part of the, of the research in affective computing. So here, uh, if, you are, if you are interested in understanding the types of sensors that you can use in the, in the car uh, environment, uh, you can read this paper. And for a more general overview of uh, what's going on nowadays in, in driver emotion recognition for intelligent vehicles, uh, there's this uh, recent survey that I uh, would recommend you to read. Um, okay, uh, okay I, I'm gonna very briefly mention another project that we are working on. And in this case, uh, what we are doing is we are bringing the same type of, um, of um, assisted driving technology to a pediatric, pediatric hospital. And the idea is the following. So in collaboration with Hyundai and other institutions, um, we, we created this small car that you see here uh, that is um, equipped with uh, the same types of sensors that you might use in, um, uh, for, for designing these, uh, these assisted driving te uh, technologies. Uh, but the idea here is to use the car as a medical device to reduce the anxiety of, of, of kids that need to go through surgery. And um, the hypothesis is that first you can use the car to monitor the emotional state and, and the, the, the degree of stress of the kid uh, with all of these uh, sensors. And the other thing is that you can provide the car with some AI that can, uh, that can um, 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 be proactive and, and do some kind of interventions based on, you know, that there's a screen, you can display some videos, the car can produce music, there are changes in the colors and so on, so that you can have uh, all these interventions that can hopefully distract the car, the, the kid, and reduce the stress before, before the surgery. So, as I was saying, the car has uh, all of these sensors. Uh, right now, we are running the user study in hospitals in San Diego, in Barcelona. Uh, unfortunately, this project was a bit delayed because of COVID, and, and actually, some of the sensors uh, cannot be used nowadays because uh, we wanted to analyze facial expression, but now we cannot do this because uh, the kids need to wear a mask. But still, um, yeah, so far, um, the, the, the results that we are observing with, um, with the questionnaires on stress and so on seem to be um, very promising. And this is one example of, you know, one technology that is designed for assistive driving, but then you suddenly can apply and, and use this kind of robotic car in a very different domain and for a, for a very, I mean, for, for a very different purpose, right? It's, it's still reducing anxiety or reducing stress, but in, in, a, in a very different scenario. Um, okay, so I just have, now I'm gonna skip one, one other example that I wanted to ex tell you about because I want to make sure they have at least two minutes to talk about the challenges in effective computing. Um, so, as actually, one of the questions before was like, how much uh, time will we need to have this perfect system that, that can recognize emotions? And, and as I said, I think we are really, really far away um, because there are a lot of challenges that we need to be aware, not just when we um, develop this research, but also when we apply and when we use this research or these, uh, or these, um, um, techni these um, technologies. And so one of the challenges that I was discussing is the difficulty of giving this emotional meaning to an isolated signal. And I talked about the face, right? That you cannot just look at the face of someone and, 
and know what this person is feeling. That's, uh, that's uh, actually not possible. Um, so, uh, and, and the same with physiology, right? I mean, you can, so physiology, so for instance, heart rate correlates pretty well with arousal, right? When your heart rate increases, usually it's because your body is more ready to act. So this correlates very well with arousal, but as we discussed, arousal is just one emotional dimension, right? What happens with uh, valence? Uh, I don't know. And valence actually is not uh, something that uh, you can um, you can um, recognize just by analyzing heart rate. So um, yeah, it's just one isolated signal. Uh, you know, it doesn't give uh, complete information of the emotional state. So usually, the best thing that you can do is combine different signals. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is uh, data labeling, that you have multiple ground truths and you might have bias. And we talked a little bit about the subjectivity problem, but um, let me let me explain uh, very quickly this scenario. So usually imagine that you have a target person, which is the person that you are attempting to recognize in his or her emotion, right? So this person is going to experience some emotion. So, so while this person experiences this emotion, this person might be more or less aware of the emotion that is experiencing. Sometimes, I don't know, we're just angry and we don't know why we are angry or sometimes it's, it's difficult for us to uh, deeply understand the emotion that we are experiencing, but this is something that is happening. Second, this person, besides experiencing some emotion, might be intentionally expressing some emotion. And that's the scenario that we have. We already have two different ground truths. And then there's an observer which is gonna perceive the emotion but this observer, again, is going to perceive this emotion according to some internal state. This is something that, you know, can change as well. I mean, sometimes um, you don't um, interpret the same way a situation. It also depends on how you feel at that moment, right? So around emotions, around um, affective computing, there's often some kind of ambiguity that we need to deal with and that we need to be aware of when we uh, work on this um, and then ethical considerations. So for sure, privacy is a concern, and particularly, as I, as I mentioned, some of the applications of affective, affective computing are in the domain of, um, of um, uh, medical applications. So um, you know, it's, uh, we are dealing sometimes with sensitive information, so we really need to be aware of that and make sure that um, you know, uh, people uh, give the consent, people understand um, you know, what, what we are doing in case that they are participating in some research or they are do, using some, some technology and we need to be aware that uh, we need to preserve this privacy. And then uh, the need for transparency, right? We, we want models, hopefully, that are explainable at some point. It's a little bit about explainability, but we don't want these models to have biases or to uh, perform unfairly. So these are things that we need to have in mind when we work in this area. And then, of course, we need to be aware of the limitations of the technology to use it correctly, right? And one example is what I was saying, that you may have a perfect system that captures the affect of uh, messages in Twitter, but then you cannot assume that this system is going to do as text sentiment analysis in any situation. It's probably going to fail when you try to use it in another domain. So you need to be aware of the limitation of this perfect system that you have in a very specific context. Okay, so. Just quickly, a bit, uh, a bit of recap. So we talked about affective computing. I define um, the field. I explain the motivation, and um, we talked about the most, a little bit the history of the field. Um, we talked about how can machines recognize emotion, different types of signals. We have seen uh, different uh, examples of research that use these types of affective, affective computing technologies. And finally, I, I briefly talked about the challenges in affective computing. So I hope that more or less you, you got an overview of the field and, um, and if you have more questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Agatha. We have some, some last question in the last two minutes. If, if you have three mi more minutes, you can respond. Uh, so for the technology based on language, can we find available resources in other languages but English? Yes, uh, yeah, that's a great question, actually. And so it's true that um, when 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 you um, when you try to do um, um, things, uh, real applications related to language, and you look for resources, most of the models that that you find that are trained, most of the public data sets that you can use for training your models are in English. But still, there are some resources in other languages, Spanish, French, Chinese, uh, many languages, 
there are some people that specifically study how to transfer um you know the, 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 um, how, 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 how to transfer a, a, a model that that works well for a specific language to another language there's work also in automatic translation so yes you can find resources in other languages um, but it's true that you mainly so so most of the resources are in english but still you can you can work in other languages yeah. and the last one uh what are the main challenges to create robots that can interact with us in socially intelligent manner okay yes um okay so for for a robot like like um the one that i they was talking about uh, the emotional coach um so in order so so for the robot to really be able being able of having this uh this uh, smart interaction with us there are like different um, types of ai that need to be working well so one of them you need you, you maybe need perfect uh a perfect system for doing the speech to text right you really want to um to do this speech to text so that you have then the words that the person said that you can analyze with natural language processing right so you also need the perfect understanding of the language a, the, a perfect ability of generating um an answer right and a, an answer that is um appropriate to the, the the semantic meaning of the input but hopefully also an answer that it's empathetic eventually right so here uh, again um, and the emotion perception and the emotion technologies plays an important role. So actually, there are so many technologies that need to be uh, adva more advanced than they are now. Um, yeah, so I guess that the challenges are, uh, there are multiple challenges in AI, right? Both in natural language processing, both in speech to text, both in uh, audio processing, both in, uh, in computer vision, right? If you really want to understand um, the, the patient's expression or in the, and the gestures and so on. So multiple challenges in, in value. Okay, so we are on time. Thank you a lot, Agatha, for your presentation. We will publish this, this presentation in our YouTube channel. So uh, the the audience could, could could back and review some some topic that you uh, talked to us uh, today. So at the name of Tsidai, thank you a lot. And I hope you see you soon in other activities from, from this initiative. Thank you very much. And well, see you. I hope we see you soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone. See you soon.